to North Reports Television. This is your October edition, and tonight we're going to have a show called Our Electronic Vehicles Ready for Prime Time. My guest is going to be our trusty True North reporter, Michael Bolowski, mm -hmm. and I believe Lou is going to be calling in remotely, so we, we'll wait for him to call in. Mike, you recently wrote an article about the problems with um, the battery technology in electronic vehicles. Mm -hmm. and, well, that's the biggest problem. There's other problems, but right. a lot of it. And I want to go into that, but before I go into that, I want to touch, make a distinction between the concept of electronic vehicles in principle and the reality. I, I think the, con personally, I think the concept itself is eventually going to win out. But I think if the politicians leave it alone, and what, I think a lot of the things that you picked up on are symptoms of a technology that's not ready yet. So yes. what's happening? What's happening is you got political social engineers trying to, they're, they're strangling the goose before he has a chance to lay any golden eggs. And you, you, they're going to end up destroying what is, I believe, a promise in technology and actually is part of a bigger trend, the electrification of our economy mm -hmm. and the automation of a lot of things. You've got, sure. well, you, you know, um, a big deal in a lot of your cars now is these global positioning systems. You can. Yeah. It's the only reason I'm here today. <laughs> <laughs> well, time. ideally, they believe, you know, the next step in the global position system is you don't just program the thing to tell you where to go, mm -hmm. but it's keyed into the car and it'll tell the car where to go and you, you can oh. maybe read a book in the car. Wow, I've got my own opinions about that, but, but I, I, I know that's where they're trying to push things, it, certainly. It's possible to do that and have, the, the question is, there, well, there's a lot of questions regarding how it gets controlled and the private. But the question is, do you grab on to a technology and see that you, you have a lot of emerging technologies by themselves have pros and cons, but this is part of a larger trend. And you have a tendency to, for people to get overexcited mm -hmm. and want to that's, push. That's what I see. Yep. And push it. And that um, makes a backlash. And the backlash is against, gets people tuned, t turned off. To the, uh, my background is engineering, so I'm a technophile. Mm -hmm. I'm very much into the new technology. But historically, new developments like this turn off the public if people start using it as a control device to control people's behavior. Or try so the automation certainly the automation the automation has a po has a potential to do the opposite it has a potential to allow people to gain more control you know social media for one example mm -hmm. and it has a potential to free up people but it also it has potential both ways so you have you have there's when 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 there's a lot of change there's a back backlash anyway because mm -hmm. people don't like new things but if the new things if they see that their freedom being impinged upon. Mm -hmm. and they see something forced upon them that doesn't make sense, they're going to reject it and you're going to destroy the market for it. And that's what I want to go into at first because I believe in principle, well, you got electronic vehicles, okay, you, 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 if the technology was there, you would have lower maintenance costs because you wouldn't have, there's a lot of Perhaps things. Perhaps the batteries, if they were to break if, down, are if, quite if, pricey to fix. Right, I mean, I'm saying if, if the, the problem with that is because the, the battery technology is not there. Right, the efficiency of the battery. Right. Yeah. So you have, in, in principle, like electronic car, sh in principle, could be more efficient because you don't have the in and out. Less and moving out. parts. Yeah, That's there's less moving parts, right. but also the energy production system is, you got the ratio of input to output, ideally, would be a lot better. That's why they consider it green. You've got the, the no emissions. The reason why it's not... It's because the reality is the battery technology is not ready. Right, and that battery has to be charged by right. electricity, which you know yeah. comes from all different sources. Um, I think the last numbers I had from a couple years back, uh, wind and solar combined in the United States account for I think it's like three or four percent of our electricity oh. usage. And that I know there's other energies that they consider renewable, but if that's going to be the benchmark. Um, then well, that, that, that brings not, another issue. The, right. It's not just electronic cars. You've got all kinds of gadget connecting to the internet. So you have the electrification of our economy. Mm -hmm. the, the portion of our economy that runs on electricity is growing. 
And so the portion of economy that runs on traditional fuels is shrinking. It might not be shrinking in absolute sense because the economy as a whole is growing. But in terms of percentage, the portion of our economy that, that, rec that um, depends upon electricity is growing and por portion of our economy depends upon fossil fuels is shrinking. That is a trend that is happening because of technological developments, not mm -hmm. social engineering things. And this has been happening. The computer revolution had a lot to do with it. The computer, the computer Silicon Valley is one of the most deregulated parts of the economy. Mm -hmm. And so this is, this is coming about from a portion of the economy that's highly deregulated. So my, if people want to see this happen, then they might want to encourage our political wannabe saviors to get out of the way. So my, um, that's another argument uh, going back to renewables. Renewables are not efficient produce, produ producers of electricity, or are they, um, they don't produce the electricity in the quantity we hour, need, and they it's don't produce the quality of electricity. So if, if we're going to have an electrified economy and you're going to have electric cars, well, we have a line one. Let's take a look. Hello, is this Lou? Yes, it is. Hi, Lou. How you doing? Good. How are you? Doing well. We're, we're uh, dividing up the, uh, the, the electric car um, issue into two parts. We're talking about how, in principle, it's a good idea, but they're, they're forcing it before it's ready, so they're gonna, we're going to... Um, probably kill the uh, goose before it lays any golden eggs. Oh, interesting. So if we electrify our economy further and we switch to all electric vehicles, then the amount of electricity required to power the economy jumps a lot. Well, it, it's, tech, it's complicated. What, the, in, an, in an ideal scenario for electric cars, what we have right now is an electric grid that produces power um, whether you're using it or not. In other words, it's always being produced. It, it's inefficient to shut right. down gas and coal and nuclear power plants at night when people are sleeping just to crank them up again in the morning. They don't do it like that. So a lot of the power goes to waste. So in an ideal scenario, you would want electric cars to be charging at night because then it's right. using power that would otherwise go to waste. And obviously, that's not always when they're going to be charged. People have to use their cars and throughout the day. But the other, um, this goes back to a, a issue that we were of the old the smart grid idea and the storing, the storing of electricity and being able to switch it for when it's usable. But that's that's another issue. What I'd like to talk about. I'd like to bring up this video here. This is the chairman of Toyota, and he's all for electric, electric cars, but he doesn't think that we're ready for it, and he doesn't think it's a good idea for the political sector of our society to be forcing it upon us, because now the car, car manufacturers are forced into building something that the technology's not ready for, and there's no market for. So they, they're gonna, he believes they're gonna screw up the market, and he, he's, um, he's, of course, he's speaking in Japanese, and it's being translated into English. Can you? Jump over to that one here. And mm, this one? Yeah. And uh, Okay, hit play. Hit, hit, hit to blow up the, yeah, then hit This the, one right here, and then hit the blow up. Yeah, right. While I felt change would be forthcoming, the pace of change far exceeded our imagination. We were aware that if the hybrid technology was to be widely accepted, convenience for the user, the consumer experience, would have to be a key consideration. The hybrid experience it actually enhanced it by reducing the amount of trip to the gas station because it was more fuel efficient as we continued our work on the hybrid we realized something else we realized that electrification is inevitable and the vehicle needed to be equipped with a system to supply electric power to the motor did they, she say it needs to be louder hmm? did she say it needs to be louder with all the necessary technology
Okay, well, okay. we apologize, Murphy's Law. Um, we had a video queued up and it just did not, as the viewers, we thank you for putting up with that, but obviously you could not hear. We, we could hear it here, but we're told that it wasn't being... Right. It, it, it wasn't being picked up by the, uh, by, by the main system. Right. So, in any case, Lou, you own an electric car, don't you? Do you want to say, what, what are your feelings on all this? Uh, yes, actually, um, yeah, my wife and I uh, drive a 2013 Chevrolet Volt. Uh, I, I purchased it used. Uh, it had, uh, was at the end of its lease, I, I, the oh, first owner of the car traded it in at the end, I guess it was a three-year lease. Um, so as far as cost goes, um, I thought it was a, a, a really good deal. Um, I did a fair amount of reading uh, about the various vehicles before we purchased it, and I, I like the Volt. Um, I like the technology. Um, I mean, I, I certainly can't speak on the infrastructure aspect. I know Michael's done a lot of research and reporting on that. But I can certainly speak from the car owner's perspective, and um, the it, it's well between. I drive every day a gasoline vehicle. My wife uses the Volt and primarily drives around town. I live here in Middlebury, and you know she uh, goes to meetings, uh, shopping, whatever, using the Volt, and she primarily runs it on the battery. The Volt is kind of, uh, the, the platform of it is a little different from the Prius. In fact, I, I prefer it to the Prius because it's um, not an automatic, you know, switching back and forth between the combustion engine and the, the battery. Mm -hmm. it's, it's up to the driver to decide what mode you want to drive in. So General Motors designed a couple of different driving modes um, in which you either drive all gas, um, uh, there's a setting for, you know, sort of more high-speed interstate driving and also, um, you know, mountain driving, which really comes in handy here in Vermont, which is why the Volt is a, a really good vehicle for Vermonters. Uh, the other thing is it does have, uh, you know, regenerative braking, as a lot of these cars do, where uh, coasting and braking downhill travel kind of put energy back into the, the battery pack. So it's got a lot of neat features. Uh, I, I got a question. Yeah, go ahead. Did, did I understand you to say that you can switch it back and forth from gasoline power to, is this a hybrid you're describing? Uh, you know, it's, a, it, it's not a true hybrid in the sense that it's automatic in that sense, but yes, it is a hybrid. You can, okay. can choose to, uh, it's got a four-cylinder uh, gasoline motor, um, and, and, and it has a uh, lithium battery pack. And it recharges while you drive it in the gasoline. The, the battery recharges during that period. Is that how it works? Right, yeah. Oh, and, and then you, it's a plug-in, too. So, you know, if you run down the battery, and, and this is what's called a first-generation Volt. The second generation mm -hmm. came out, I think, in 2015, and they have a much longer range. I have mm -hmm. about a 40-mile eh, range on it fully charged. But if you run out of that battery, you can just go to a gas station and... Well, right. no. Uh, well, uh, if, if the battery runs down, I mean, I've driven the car to Pennsylvania, about a 350-mile one-way trip from Vermont, and you can run it on the battery until the battery runs out, and then it automatically switches to gas. So it's not okay. like... I think early perceptions of people was that, oh, I'm not going to drive a Volt because... You know, when the battery runs out, I'm stranded. Well, that's not true. Um, I well, think General some of Motors the electric cars, that is true, though, not well, this one. Well, right. that's cause that is what the um, the distinction that the sorry, when no one could hear it, but oh. the the chairman of Toyota was talking about the hybrids that they had made and how it was enhanced the driving experience for the customers. Okay. And he was making a distinction between hybrids and all electric cars. Yeah. Yeah, um, and then, of course, uh, Chevrolet has a new vehicle called the Bolt, which is all electric, and right. that has uh, around a 250-mile uh, range on its battery. So that's a pretty significant increase in battery range. Again, that wouldn't get me to Pennsylvania one way completely, 
uh, it would probably get me down to around the Newburgh, New York area from, from Vermont. And how long does it take you to charge up the battery? Uh, for the Volt, uh, it's, well, I can't say because it's always plugged in at night. So um, I'll, I'll plug it in at night. <laughs> it's ready to go the next morning. Yeah, the time that. Yeah, so if you got halfway between here and Pennsylvania, the, the, the charging time, it, it would lengthen your, your travel time by quite a bit. Uh, only if I wanted to run it on the battery. Um, I, uh, otherwise, right, we, but I, I mean, I'm saying hypothetically, if this was an all battery. Yes, correct, correct. Yeah, you'd have to because you wouldn't have a gasoline backup, which is why personally I wouldn't go all electric yet, unless it was a second car that I might use as a town car, where you know you're just even you know driving from Middlebury to Burlington or or to Montpelier, you could easily do it and still have plenty of juice left in the battery probably right. for a whole week. If not, yes. but, um, you know, there are other issues um, that, you know, say, um, uh, you know, heavy duty electric vehicles, you know, what, how's this applied to, say, trucking, electric trucks? Right. You know, I, I really don't know much about it, but I, I should say that General Motors had originally designed the Volt, and I've done some research on this and, and talked to, uh, our Chevy dealership here in Middlebury, Deneker Chevrolet, where I bought the vehicle, and they are certified, uh, they have certified mechanics and electricians to work on the uh, electrics of the car. It had originally been designed for a uh, fuel cell mm -hmm. uh, rather than a, um, a lithium battery, or no, I shouldn't say that, for an electric, uh, for the gasoline to have a fuel cell. And uh, General Motors, I guess, wasn't quite ready to introduce a fuel cell, but from what I've heard is it is down the road. So the car could likely, if, if, if I want to hang on to it that long or the next owner of it, uh, could, could conceivably retrofit, it, uh, retrofit the gas engine and put a fuel cell. And, of course, fuel cells are kind of a battery. They were mm -hmm. uh, really pioneered by NASA's Project Gemini program, some of those long duration Gemini flight <laughs> in the 60s used fuel cells and it basically uh, provides you know it does a kind of a catalytic conversion of water you know, it breaks down the hydrogen and then uh, powers uh, the vehicle you know a vehicle or spacecraft you, you got also the Toyota chairman was talking about the possibility of the, they're actually working on now solid state batteries uh, okay and well and Toyota I know they pioneered hydrogen vehicles. Yes, uh, but there's no infrastructure for hydrogen. That no. would be my personal um, ideal fuel well, source, rather than electric. You're describing what you think would be the best use for all, and that's letting the market, letting the customer decide. Yeah. What, what, were, I mean, what were, um, and I, which I agree with. I think you know, eventually, if we get all the technolo technological issues straightened out, I think this it's going to go that way. But what, what we're concerned about, and, and there's, there's a push by some politicians, you know, Vermont wants to be first in everything, yes. to move us all towards electric cars. And we don't know when it's going to be ready, so you can't have a politician's five-year plan and say, look, we're going to move them all this way. Because it's going to turn a lot of people off, and then right. people, the arguments that you're making is going to be lost upon people because they're going to be frustrated. Agree. I agree, and of course, Central planning of anything is usually a disaster. Uh, you know, history has kind of shown that. So, I, you know, I don't think you can foist technology on people. Um, I, I just see it evolving, and I, you know, it is happening. People are going electric, and but you know, I think it makes more sense to do it in steps rather than some draconian act. That that you know, there, there, it's just not thought through. Uh, is my personal opinion. Um. I, I just want to, you, you don't need to say what you paid for it unless you want to, but my concern is that the Nissan Leaf, up until recently here in Burlington, was being sold for, I want to say, eleven or $12,000. Now, the problem with that is it's a $30,000 car. So if you do the math, that's like a, almost a two-thirds um, subsidy or rebate or a combination 
anyway, financial assistance one way or another. Sure. And um, well, yes, I mean Chevy was uh, I guess they're subsidized somewhat. I don't know where their current state is, but again, I bought the car used, so it was a significant right. Uh, you already got that discount. Well, yeah, I paid. It was around geez, eighteen thousand, something like that. But I, I'm a fan of that show on TV, to use an analogy, Shark Tank, the one with Mark Cuban and the folks who listen to different business plans and business models, and they either embrace it and give you money, or they tell you to run for the door. And I can't imagine standing in front of Mark Cuban and those folks and saying, I've got this brilliant product that's going to save the world. Oh, and by the way, in order to make it um, marketable. marketable, it needs to be 30 or 60% subsidized. I think they would laugh you out the door before you even got the finish given your spiel. <laughs> yeah. um, and I, I know that the technology is getting better all the time, but it's clearly not there yet. Um, and it's probably not going to get there as quick if you cut the process off by subsidizing the existing technology and trying right. to force You're it. You're absolutely on. right, because it, it, if, if given the time to evolve, you'll, you'll get a better product and, right. a, and a better you know, power source uh, or yeah. package to, to power the vehicle. And one of the articles I was reading, one of the subsidies they wanted to make like electronic cars available to the poor is if, why is it another car not good enough for them? But, you know, we're using, the, we're using this in the name of the poor as if this is going to benefit them. But then all of a sudden, okay, like, you know, if they have them long trips, it's harder to do if it's an all-electric car. You get a subsidy that's 60%, but maintenance costs until they get this battery tech maintenance costs on these batteries are not cheap right yes and i i should say that you know i bought an extended warranty on the lithium battery pack on my volt which was you know available through the manufacturer uh just because it was one of these uh you know gm approved uh used cars where they you know they check it out and and um so there was some warranty on the vehicle already, but I wanted a little extra insurance on the battery because knowing just how expensive it would be to replace a battery pack of that size. Right. Um, well, this reminds me, you know, I used to be product engineer at IBM, and so I'm, the computer industry is something that I'm using as <coughs> an example a lot of times. Your early computers were monolithic, huge beast with very little power and they cost a fortune. Now most people for a very little amount of money relatively can have something far better and far more powerful than the most expensive early, early computers. So has, has Rob Maynard just admitted he's a computer geek? <laughs> <laughs> I like the technology. I'm not an applications geek. I'm, I understand that. guy. Huh? You're a hardware guy? No, I understand this, the engineering theory and behind the hardware and software. So, because I was, I studied mathematics and, engin and engineering, so I can, I can probably figure out a, a problem b based upon the error code. But it take me, I have, but I, I'm not really, I'm not, I haven't tinkered with all these applications. I just, it's the, the underlying principles behind it. I understand, but what what we're going through now is the equivalent of going of the uh, early days trying to force the IBM mainframe on everybody. Yeah. I'm well, you know, I find it interesting that really the first sort of practical electric cars appeared as early as the 1880s. Yes. And they didn't certainly take off, but um, yeah, gosh, I remember my father, who passed away at the age of 100 two years ago, he still remembered one or two of these old, I don't know if they were Franklin's uh, electric cars, and he remembered right neighbor in his town who had one and uh it had you know it was loaded with big lead acid batteries and and the guy drove it a couple of blocks and, and took it out every sunday or something but and that was an old timer you know from yes. probably the late teens that he was still driving but, um, if there's something i can interject here we talk about forcing this product onto the market um that is actually quite literally happening um if I'll just read an excerpt from my article, Vermont is one of the states that requires automakers to meet the California vehicle emissions requirements, often called the Zero Emissions Vehicle or ZEV program. 
those regulations require automakers to have a certain number of credits associated with the sale of plug-in vehicles. So it's not just the financial incentives in the form of rebates and tax credits. There is also a mandate mm -hmm. to sell the cars by the state, which I did not know about until I wrote this article. Well, I, I wanted to mention that. I think, Michael, you wrote... Uh, back in your watchdog, Vermont watchdog days, mm -hmm. you write an article about um, possibly taxing electric vehicles because they weren't paying uh, a gasoline tax? Oh, uh, well, that was another issue that came up. Yeah, um, Vermont relies on a gasoline tax for, I believe it's uh, roadways for filling potholes and whatnot. And obviously that would have to be mitigated in some way if we were to go you know, full forward with this electric car thing. Hmm. So that is another thing to think about. Right. Um, but my, my big takeaway from writing this article was that I, my, my father owns a hybrid. He owns one of the Priuses. And I think it's a neat technology. I think the hybrids are pretty much there because, yes, you're paying $30,000 for a car, but you're not paying as much money for gas. I don't know how much you would save, assuming you'd have to drive the car at least for several years uh, to get most of your money back. But um, if you buy a hybrid today and, and use it for seven, eight, nine years spending, what do you think you spend on gas for a hybrid? Your, yours is technically a hybrid. So what, what do you think? Uh, God, I couldn't tell you. I, I'd say. You know, I'm not, I'm not a numbers guy, so okay. I don't. And, and it depends on where you live and who's driving it and all these different variables. Mm -hmm. But I know I spend about $100 a month on gas. But well, well, I can tell you, actually, although I don't have it at my fingertip, is GM has a very nice, um, the car uploads uh, data to, I guess it's through their General Motors OnStar program, where you get an email, basically a monthly status report on your vehicle it'll tell you um you know what your mpg is it'll tell you whether or not your you know front right tire is needs to be inflated because it's low not, it's pretty amazing um is, and i, I guess you know i look at them and read them but i should pay more attention to it analytically which i'm not doing but um uh, I'm pretty impressed with 150 miles per gallon. And um, so. getting, getting back to the zero emissions, that goes back to something that we have talked about before. When they're talking about non-polluting, they're talking simply about emissions. And they're not talking about the whole process. You got the conversion process, you got the disposal process. Disposing of these batteries is not environmentally um, pristine to begin with. A lot with. of heavy metals in yes. batteries. I mean, if you get a solid state battery or a, or a fuel cell, you got it is a different issue. But like I said, we're not fully there yet. A lot of the lithium ion batteries and a lot of these heavy metal, they've got a lot of disposal issues in terms of environmental sensitivity. Well, personally, I mean, I, I, I've always been an advocate personally of, of a hydrogen economy. And, uh, you know, you already have an infrastructure of gasoline stations. It's, you know, I, I guess, of course, there's a cost to retrofitting them for hydrogen. Right. Uh, and hydrogen is not, I think people just have this sort of uh, Hindenburg <laughs> notion of, oh, my God, hydrogen, who wants to touch it? But, yeah. you know, you look at the, the Hindenburg disaster, and it was really the... Uh, we're not going to that kind of, kind of disaster. Zeppelin that was ignited by the lightning. Um, yes. I, I hate to cut you off. I guess we're at the 20 second warning. Um, okay. Any closing comments? <laughs> um, well, I say, I, I th personally, I think there's there is a lot of work that still has to be done in electric vehicles, and I personally don't like central authority telling me what I should or should not drive. Okay. Well, we've got the five, four, three, two, one going on over there. So thank you for watching. See you next month.